Good afternoon and welcome to the 727th meeting of the Economic Club of New York. I'm Barbara Van Allen, President and CEO of the club. The Economic Club is known as the nation's most prominent forum for nonpartisan discussions on social, economic, and political issues. More than a thousand private guests have appeared before the club over the last century. And uh, our, our record for excellence continues, obviously, up to including today. I want to extend a warm welcome to students from NYU Stern School of Business, the Gabelli School of Business over at Fordham, and Mercy University, who are joining us virtually as well. We also have members of our largest ever class of fellows, which is a diverse, rising, next-gen uh, group of business thought leaders. And uh, we now have, it's now we're into October, the, the application for this annual program for 2024 is available online to our members. Today, I'm really honored to welcome back Mary Daly. Mary leads the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, the largest and most diverse Federal Reserve District, home to one-fifth of the nation's population. In this role, she charters a vision of the bank as a premier public service organization dedicated to promoting an economy that works for all Americans and supporting the nation's financial and payment systems. She's at the forefront of the Federal Reserve System's price stability and full employment mandates as a member of the um, Federal Open Market Committee. Mary assumed leadership of the Fed in San Francisco in 2018, starting as an economist specializing in labor market dynamics and economic inequality, and sub subsequently served in many roles, including EVP and director of research. Her research advances understanding of the Federal Reserve's maximum employment and inflation mandates, most notably through her studies of wage rigidity and natural rate of unemployment. Her work has also highlighted the overall economic benefits of reducing wage and employment gaps among different demographic groups. Through her speeches and public commentary, she helps demystify key issues faced by monetary policymakers, including topics such as inflation dynamics, financial stability, and the relationship between monetary policy and inequality. She is a research associate at the IZA Institute of Labor Economics and has held visiting research positions at CBO, Cornell University School of Public Policy, and multiple universities and research institutes throughout California. She also has served on numerous advisory boards, including the CBO, the Social Security Administration, the Office of Rehabilitation Research and Training, the Institute of Medicine, the Library of Congress, Syracuse, Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, and the Center for First Generation Student Success. She currently serves on the Urban Institute's Board of Trustees. So the format today will be, uh, we'll start with opening remarks by Mary, followed by a conversation. And we're honored to have co-host of Bloomberg Surveillance at Bloomberg TV, Lisa Abramowitz as our moderator. Time permitting, we will have questions from the room again, time permitting. As a reminder, this conversation is on the record and we do have quite a bit of media on the line and a fair amount in the room. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Mary. Please join me. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction and thank you all for being here. It's terrific to be here once again and in speaking to the Econ Club, Economic Club of New York. I was here last on a virtual screen, but that was also enjoyable. This is much, much better. I tell my employees that every day, it's much better together. So thank you very much for the invitation back and I look forward to a great discussion. Now, before we get started, is this, hold on. Okay. Um, before we get started, I would like to take a few minutes to describe how I see the current economic environment and the uncertainties and the trade-offs that we face and we calibrate policy. The key takeaway for today in my opening remarks is that the moment we're in calls for optionality. We must keep our minds open so we can respond as conditions evolve. Vigilance and agility are paramount to finishing the job. And in case you're wondering, the job, of course, is to restore price stability as gently as we can. Now, the good news is at this point, we have time to get it right. 
the economy and policy are in a much better place than they were just a year ago. Growth and inflation are gradually slowing, and the risk of the outlook are largely balanced. Mm -hmm. Monetary policy is restricted, and financial conditions are tight. So we don't have to rush to make any additional decisions. I'm sorry, I can't do really it. Okay. I think I'm not on this mic. I'm on this mic. So is that better, sir? Okay. I'm, my apologies. We got everything good now? Okay. Um, but progress isn't victory, and we must remain resolute to finish the job. A gradual return to 2% is in our sights, but it is not yet in our grasp. And that is the final mile. But before I go further and explain more detail what I mean, I'd like to say that the views I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of my colleagues or anyone else within the Federal Reserve System. So I mentioned just a moment ago that the economy and policy are in a better place. And so let me begin by taking stock of where we have been and how far we have come. Now, as all of you will recall, in March of 2022, just 18 months ago, the FOMC had a problem. Headline and core inflation had risen to multi-decade highs and were projected to keep increasing. Inflation expectations, especially at the short end, were close behind. And there were concerns that this could generate a more worrisome increase in medium and longer run infl expected inflation. So the FOMC began to tighten policy rapidly. And since that time, we have raised the federal funds rate by 525 basis points to its highest level in 22 years. And these cumulative increases have moved policy well into restrictive territory. Indeed, the real federal funds rate, the one that we actually think is the part that tightens the economy, if the real funds rate as measured by the nominal funds rate less one year ahead inflation expectation exceeds almost all measures of its neutral value. And we are seeing the effects of this tightening on the economy. Headline and core inflation have both declined significantly, bringing us much closer to our 2% goal. As my context in the 12th district, as Barbara said, is a fifth of the United States and it's all of the Western states, they tell me that this decline in inflation, and I'm sure you're seeing this here, is having an immediate positive effect on households, businesses, and communities who have been struggling on a treadmill of constantly rising prices and falling purchasing power. And that relief that these consumers, businesses, and communities are feeling in their wallets is translating directly into more, in more positive views on their part about future inflation. And we see that dynamic play out in the aggregate measures of short-run inflation expectations, which have been falling almost one for one with declines in published inflation. But perhaps most encouragingly, and I really want to underline this, is that the welcome decline in inflation we've all been waiting for has come without a significant deterioration in economic growth or the labor market. The economy and the labor market are slowing but not severely or abruptly. And these developments have led market participants, businesses, and households to replace fears of recession with hopes for a soft landing. And that's a sea change from earlier this year. I see what I've just described as unequivocally good news. But to ensure that we fully achieve the outcomes we want, sustainable price stability, and a healthy and balanced labor market, a durable, healthy, and balanced labor market, we need to finish the work. And so the question is, what will this require? And there is where I want to put two words, vigilance and agility. So let me start with vigilance. We need to be vigilant in assessing the odds that the good data we've been seeing is actually setting a new trend, rather than just being a temporary relief that will stall out or plateau too early, leaving us short of our goals. And either is possible. Either the we can just simply extrapolate from what we've been seeing and say that more good news is on the way, or we could say that this is just a, a partial rebalancing and we might stall out and we'll be well above what we need to be ultimately. Now, I've discussed in some detail the recent positive data and how you might think that should continue. But I want to also talk about why these developments might plateau. 
The key reason that these developments could plateau is that the economy still has considerable momentum. And we're a long way from 2% on inflation and a long way from a sustainable pace on job growth. So those things both are saying that we still have a ways to go and they could stall out because we have so much momentum. And I think headline data really tell the story. I know all of you in this room pour over the headline data as we do. And in the labor market, for instance, even with the recent slowing we've seen, and we're all awaiting the jobs report tomorrow, but even with the recent slowing we've seen in, in this last several months, job growth remains well above what is needed to keep pace with overall labor force growth. And other indicators point to ongoing strength in the labor market. Inflation is similar. While overall inflation has fallen, it continues to be almost two percentage points higher than our target on a 12-month basis. Now, as I said, it's possible that all the slowing we see actually just predicts well, it will translate, it predicts and will translate into a study march towards our goals, that this is something to start of good and we'll continue to see it as we work through the coming months. But in the case of inflation, I think there are real risks to this projection and ones that we have to carefully study. Many components of inflation are coming down just as we would expect. Those are goods, housing, those are coming down and we expect them to continue to slow. But non-housing core services, often called super core, has been relatively sticky and remains far above its pre-pandemic level. And this type of inflation, this super core, often lags recovery in the other sectors. So there's not a reason to worry yet. But we will need to see some progress in this category to be fully confident that we are on the path back to price stability. So what does all of this mean for policy? And this is where agility comes in. We need to be positioned and prepared for however the economy evolves, and we need to have options. If we continue to see a cooling labor market and inflation heading back to our target, we can hold interest rates steady and let the effects of policy continue to work. And it's important to recognize, and I know most of you, or if all, not all of you know, that even if we hold rates study exactly where they are today, policy is going to grow increasingly more restrictive as inflation and inflation expectations fall because the real rate will rise. So holding rates study, even no change, is an active policy action on the part of the FOMC. I would say similarly, just like if the labor market continues to cool and inflation continues to slow, if financial conditions, which have tightened considerably in the past 90 days, and if they should remain tight, well, then the need for us to take further action is diminished because financial markets are already moving into that direction and they've done the work. We don't need to do it more. But in contrast, and this is where you have to be optionality oriented, because in contrast, if the deceleration of growth and inflation stall, activity begins to reaccelerate, or financial conditions reverse some of this tightening and loosen too much, well, we can react to those data and raise rates further until we are confident that monetary policy is sufficiently restrictive to complete the job. So all this boils down to say this. Rather than a prejudged path of what policy will be, we need to keep an open mind and have optionality. So let me conclude with this. When I travel around my district and across the nation, I do spend a lot of time doing outreach and engagement. I see the progress we've made in the past year. And that is really worth acknowledging. We've done a lot in a short time and the economy is in a better place. But as I said at the start, Progress alone is not victory, and it will take vigilance and agility to complete the final mile. Thank you, and I look forward to our conversation. That was a fantastic uh, summary, and we all heard one line, which was, we all heard the whole thing, uh, <laughs> but I think that there's a burning question. We've, we've talked about how this is quite an interesting time for us to be having this conversation because we've seen an incredible sell-off in the bond market. And suddenly, on a longer-term basis, it seems as if the market is realizing higher for longer is for real. You said in your speech that financial conditions uh, have tightened considerably over the past 90 days. And if they remain tight, quote, the need for us to take further action is diminished. Does that mean all things being equal, if bond yields stay where they are, the Fed doesn't need to hike again? Again, I'm going to remind everybody my views are my own, and I don't speak for anyone on the, the committee. 
but the but that is exactly how I think about it. So just instead of um, that, let's go back to the June SCP, where if you remember, or maybe you don't, I'll I'll remind. In the June summary of economic projections, there were two more rate hikes projected for this year. Then in July, we took one of those rate hikes, and another one in the September SCP was the median outlook. But the bond market has tightened quite considerably over about 36 basis points since we met in September. Well, that is equivalent to about a rate hike, right? And so then the need to do tightening additionally is not there. So from my own perspective, that's what I look at. You know, that my job as I see it, our job as, as I see it is not to tighten, just do our part. It's to watch financial conditions because monetary policy works. We, we raise the funds rate and it, it, it moves through all the other interest rates. If financial conditions are sufficiently tight, our work is not necessary because we don't need to boost them more. Yeah, which, does that make sense? Absolutely. And which Clarida said today that the rise in yields actually does the Fed's job for it. Would you agree with that? Would you sympathize with that kind of sentiment? That is actually how it works, right? If financial conditions tighten, I mean, one of the things that's happened in the last 90 days and certainly in the last uh, few weeks is that financial markets have collectively seemed to take on board a variety of things. But one of the things that I heard from many commentators and many of the market outreach I do is that they, they have a general understanding now that we are committed at the FOMC to keeping rates higher for longer in an effort to bring inflation fully back down to 2%. And that recognition, along with all the other factors we could put in our list about why bond yields have risen, are affecting certainly the financial conditions and the tightening. And I see that as a, a positive outcome that we would have tighter financial conditions because then we can really get the job done of putting inflation back to rest. When is a sell-off something that's welcome from a perspective of finally the market is coming to terms with what the Fed has been saying? And when is it disorderly, disruptive sure. on a level that causes concern? So you always want an orderly repricing over a disorderly repricing. And so far, what I see is this, you know, and this is why we watch it so carefully, but here's how I'm seeing it, is that what we're having, what's happening is financial markets are actually trying to find they're footing in the right price for, for things. And they've got to digest a lot of information. One is the supply and demand uh, changes in the treasury space, right? So supply is going up and demand is, is going down, especially from foreign buyers. So that is a one factor to digest. Another factor to digest is Fed policy and forward, forward guidance in the SCP. A third factor to digest is this increasing conversation people are having about whether the real neutral rate of interest is actually risen. So we came into the pandemic or with it at about 0.5, which means nominal neutral about 2.5. And when people say, oh, the neutral rate might have risen for a variety of factors, I'm hearing everything from maybe it's five to something that I would see more likely, which is between two, five and, and three for the nominal neutral. You know, probably there is, a, we don't know if it's risen, frankly. I don't think anybody really knows, but certainly we should have those conversations. But then markets try to price that in. So all of those factors, and then there's lots of uncertainty in the economy and geopolitical risk and, you know, our own fiscal risk. And so that's what markets do. They digest a lot of information and try to find their, their footing on it. And I think that's what we're seeing. But so far, it hasn't spilled over into disorderly. So far, even today, when the jobs claims came up and it was sort of, I don't know what to make of it, right? So the, that's what the markets are read it. You didn't see things shaking up in a, in a wild or disorderly fashion. So, so far, so good. Your bond quote of the day, 470 on the 10 year. I just checked. So that's, it seems like yields are coming in uh, as we speak to your point about it not being disorderly. Back in March, when there was this concern about the banking situation, yields were at the low of March were about 150 basis points lower than where they are now. Are you seeing the same type of financial distress today that you did back then, even on the peripheries? How do you rationalize why? It hasn't materialized in the same kind of way. So March was a unique situation, and we want to learn from that unique situation. But it was a unique situation in this way: we had a bank run, an old, a very, you know, old-fashioned but true bank run, where the bank's liquidity was completely squeezed, and it went, you know, it, it dissolved in in a period that was very, it was short, rapid period of dissolution, and then that spilled over to two other banks. Um, and that was the extent. Now, the, one of the things I always remind people of is we have over 4,000 banks in the country and three failed. 
and all other banks that even felt the stresses. And there were a large number that felt stresses because they were near neighbors in sort of size and uh, balance sheet distribution composition. They felt stresses, but they managed those stresses because in part they had been a little more effective at edging their risks. And then the Fed and the Treasury with the Treasury support came in with the BTFP and that produced a lot of calmness in the water. So since that time, banking stresses have really not been something that when you ask people in the community or the business leaders, what are you just the top of your worries? That is not something they list. They list inflation, uncertainty, et cetera. So I think one of the reasons that we are seeing this uh, yield rising not spilling back over is that Essentially, we know what's going on in the banking sector. Investor letters have been published for months saying, here's what this balance sheet looks like. Here's what this balance sheet looks like. So there's not a surprise. And the second is because the banking system is safe, sound, and resilient. And we have remedies in place that solved parts of the of the crisis and the stresses. So I think we're coming in. It's the same thing when you have the rise in yields. We're doing it against a strong economy. We're doing it against a strong, a, a solid banking system. So that just means that the the ripple effects are not going to be tipping things over. The, the, the fragility is not there, right? It's a sound system. And then you have this. And so then you have it able to absorb the, the tension points. One thing that uh, there's been a huge debate around is the long and variable lags. And this really speaks to this question of all of a sudden, if you think that 10 year yields are at 5% rather than 4% or 3.5%, that changes what implication there is into different business models. How much does it change the business model of commercial real estate owners, of different residential real estate owners, of some of the constituents who you speak to on a regular basis? So I'm going to separate that's a terrific question, but I'm going to unpack it into two parts if you don't mind the long and variable lags and the how are people reacting to that? And I have a, I just met with a variety of uh, commercial real estate CEOs with, with, with national footprints on Monday. So I can bring some of that to this conversation, but let me start with the long and variable lags part. So definitely there's always a debate. If you want to really get into debate, get a PhD in economics and you'll spend a lot of time if you're in macro debating long and variable lags of monetary <laughs> policy. Um, so here's what we can all agree on. They are, there are lags and they're variable. And then people even debate about long, how long are they? But I go with long and variable lags. And the question is, we know they, that from the Fed's communications to financial markets went quickly. And then the question is, how long does it take to get through the economy? I'm of the view that we're still seeing the effects of that. We saw it initially in housing. Then we started seeing it in investment. Now we're starting to see it in, you know, the labor market and inflation, et cetera. And so it's, it's absolutely happening. And we want to continue to watch that because we ought, we're with the risk more balanced on the economy. We could as easily, I think at this point, overcorrect than undercorrect. And that's why taking the time to do it right is is sort of where um, I think we need to be. Now, on what I'm hearing in these this rise in yields, they're less concerned about, they have been less concerned, at least my commercial real estate uh, roundtable, less concerned about the lags in monetary policy as much as this. There is this time when people were in, one, of men, just, one person described it as sort of a um, it's almost like a foot race, right? But it's not really, it's really just like a, um, I have to see if the Fed will cut rates before I have to refinance my properties. And so you're in a look ahead and you're saying, well, if the Fed cuts rates, like the market suggests they will, market suggested six months ago, early in 2024, or at least by the middle of 2024, then I can, when I, by the time I refinance, I'm golden. But that equation changes if, we're higher for longer to get inflation down, or if the nominal, if the yields are just going to be higher, well, then projects that penciled out at near zero interest rates or something much lower, they don't pencil out at five. And so I think one of the things that we we think a lot about is what's the switch point for commercial real estate? Because you really want that to be an orderly repricing. And so far it has been rather than a disorderly one. But I think that's something that's a risk worth watching is that these higher yields change the psychology of what's possible for people. And they start making those adjustments um, immediately as opposed to in a, a timeline that goes with the refi schedule. Just to build on that, this idea of 5% or 4.8 or 4.7% of long-term rates that's being increasingly priced into markets, 
how much does that imply a significantly greater degree of distress in some of these areas, like real estate, commercial real estate, that rely on this idea of refinancing five, 10 years down the line? You know, it's. I, I think we have to, and this is one of the things we're going to have to do just as a nation is when you, if we're in a low, uh, higher interest rate environment in general, and I can't, I don't think we should jump to the conclusion that that's where we are. I think we should have a conversation. Is it going to be the low interest rate environment? Are we going to have a, a nominal neutral of 2.5 or is it going to be something higher? Is Are we going to be fighting inflation from above our target now for a, for a persistent amount of time? Or is it going to go back to fighting it from below our target? We don't know the answers yet. So I think what I'm what I was really important is commercial real estate owners and purchasers and things, they have to be willing to, t- to play the longer game, right? What's the longer game look like and how do I get to the longer game? And I'm hearing this in, in the San Francisco CEO roundtable. Now, they, again, these folks have a national footprint, but I'll share what I learned is that, you know, they're already tranching their properties. If you've got really high quality uh, stuff, you're putting all your work in in terms of leasing into that property, and there are deals to be had. So people with in, with income to to use, they're they're buying those properties up because you know property ultimately and buildings are valuable down the road. If you have property that you think isn't just in, in the world of higher interest rates and lower. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back to the land value. And I'm going to not try to spend a lot of time leasing that property or wait it out because, and I think that's the repricing we're going to need to see. We are just going to need to digest some of those losses and and position for the new world. The, the yields going up, I think it's just, it doesn't change that dynamic. It just brings people's awareness sharply to the problem, right? You could have seen the problem coming, and I think many did, which is why I'm not, um, I don't have alarm bells ringing. Commercial real estate people, they just tell me this all the time, and I have learned to believe them. Uh, You really have to have a strong constitution to be in commercial real estate because it goes through cycles. And the way that the successful ones persist is they recognize that the down point isn't forever nor is the high point. So they get used to it and they stockpile and they refi early. When they see interest rates going up, they're trying to put stuff into longer maturity so that they can not have to refi at the higher interest rates right away. So I think that's going on, but that is a sector to watch as all of us know. And this will be just another piece. The higher um, bond yields will be a another piece that makes the scrutiny have to be more intense. To connect that to the idea of financial distress, people talk about a Fed put. How high is the bar for the Fed put? How high is the bar for financial distress for the Fed Reserve to come in and to cut rates and to take actions to add liquidity to the system? How much higher is the bar at a time where inflation is still running at the levels that it's running? So I'm going to separate these two things. I think they get pushed together all the time in a way that I don't think about them. So I want to separate them. So there's monetary policy that's about the two goals that Congress gave us, full employment, price stability. And we raise and lower the funds rate to do those types that work. And because it's made, this is all gets conflated more easily because we have a balance sheet policy. So we use the asset purchases for two functions, market dysfunction and quantitative easing, right? To put additional policy um, accommodation in when we hit the ZLB. So we have both, but I do, they can actually persist separately. So let's take the BTFP. The BTFP didn't change monetary policy. We went in, we saw some stress in the banking sector with the help, but the backstop from the treasury opened a BT, the BTFP facility, helped calm the banking stresses and monetary policy went on. And I think that's the way you sh- should think about it. So I, I unpack those things. I hear a lot about the Fed put in this. What I really would do is, we have tools that can be used and the tools we use for financial dislocation are different than the tools we use for monetary policy and both can occur. So we shouldn't have to give up our promise to the American people, our commitment to achieve our mandated goals and bring inflation back down to price stability because we have some dysfunction in the markets. But I right now don't see dysfunction. What I see is prices have gone up for you know, bond yields. Prices have gone down. Yields have gone up for bonds. The 10-year now 
and other rates look similar to what you know we might have penciled in in the SCP for how much we were going to hold rates higher for longer because of the inflation. And I think they'll respond as the data come in to. I, mean, I think markets have a better sense now. Although I you know I can't be sure of this. I don't want to. I don't want to say things that don't I don't have certainty about, but it seems there's a, a more more of an understanding about the Fed's reaction function now. And big part of the reaction function understanding that seemed to be missing was that we want to get inflation down to 2%. And in our forecast, we don't see it coming down to 2% like that. And in order to keep it coming down to 2%, we have to keep rates restrictive in order to bring the economy more into balance, the labor market into balance, and inflation down to 2 you talked about vigilance and you talked about agility. And with respect to agility, you wanted to be able to tweak policy according to what you're seeing in markets. And, and one thing that people have been speculating, and I'm sure this is sort of one of these theoreticals that make you roll your eyes. Goodness. I never roll my eyes. <laughs> well, I will say, uh, when people talk about what you said in your speech, which is that as inflation falls and as growth slows, that the policy rate, even by not moving, by keeping it steady, is a policy action. And it is actually tightening policy. At that point, how agile should the Fed be to make adjustments to the rate so that the restrictive level is the same that might be lowering rates, but not because of financial distress, not because of some sort of recession, not because of weakness? So that's a terrific question. And and I would argue that we're now entering into the hardest phases of policy making, right? The hardest so I think of phase one is the one we just com- the one we completed. We we completed it earlier this year. Rates are too low, inflation's too high. There's only one direction north. So everybody can agree. There's no nobody's confused. It's just a matter of how quickly can you get to restrictive territory and without causing any um, concerning disruptions. So we've we've accomplished that phase one. Phase one was the easy phase. You just have to communicate, we're going that way, inflation will come down. The biggest concern that I had during that phase one, well, I had two, how fast can we go without you know, distressing things? And two, um, oh, how will we communicate that we're doing that, right? Those are the two things I was worried about. How fast can we go and how can we communicate that so that we don't lose credibility? Right. So we, because I was worried about the inflation expectation. So that's down. Phase two is fine tuning where we maintain the peak rate. And then phase three is trying to bring it down to 2%. And so right now, the way it's penciled in in the SEP, if the inflation forecast holds and the inflation forecast you see more generally, policy is growing more restrictive. So you might ask, well, why? Well, I think it's because it's it's challenging to get that super core inflation down. We've got the easy ones behind us, right? Goods inflation's already come down a lot. Housing inflation is in train. We have to keep watching it. But that super core is going to need persistent work. But if we saw, and the labor market's strong, we're, we're doing this against a very strong labor market. We'll see tomorrow if that persists. But so far, pretty strong, solid labor market, good consumer spending, good GDP growth. I mean, we're there's nothing about the economy that's faltering. So, But if that should change, well, then of course, we could adjust rates so that we keep a level of restriction right for the economy we have. I don't really want to try to tell you what that's going to be because honestly, that's what the whole speech about is about. We have to tolerate our uncertainty of not knowing what it's going to do next year, but to know what elements we have and how would we react to whatever situation unfolds. That's ultimately humans hate this and markets hate it more. Um, Nobody likes uncertainty, right? They want to know people. We all want to know exactly what's going to happen. But I think right now projecting too confidently what will happen is actually a, a, a policy mistake because then you end up with surprising people and things. So I just I think it's really important that we stick to conveying our reaction function, conveying how we trade off and balance things, how we approach the uncertainties. And then as we get more information, as everybody does, then we'll of course see what to do next. With respect to the actual economy and what's going on and what you see going on there. Uh, You talk about the labor market and how strong the labor market is. And I know you've done an incredible amount of research in economic inequality and the worker and the labor market. Through that lens, how do you view some of the labor strikes? What's going on in Detroit? What's going on with respect to the Kaiser health systems? What's going on with just uh, the Hollywood strikes, which are sort of resolved, but maybe not? So I think 
you know, the picture of the labor market is broader than just the strikes. I think the strikes get a lot of, because they're big labor actions, but, but in general, we've seen a rebalancing of, of the, of the labor relationships with firms. That is a very common occurrence in an extremely tight labor market. Right, their demand for workers is outstripped supply of workers. That means that workers would have more power to say, "I want to live here, do this, have this other thing." So, workers who aren't in unions and don't have regularly scheduled negotiated contracts, well, they can make those adjustments more continuously. Right. So, a lot. I'm mean, sure you've you've experienced this too. But if you were an employer in 22 and even late 20. One and you really saw wage demands rise, uh, special circumstances. I want to live in here and, and work in there, and I don't want to come back to the office. A lot of changes in how workers were relating to their employers. And there was also a relative demand shock for low wage workers that you know moved restaurant workers to and hotel workers to delivery drivers and other things. So that that whole work situation was changed. I see the the labor uh, actions that have been taken recently is they're on regularly negotiated contract schedules and those schedules came up and they say, well, we've got to, a lot's changed since we negotiated the last contract. Pandemic, wage rates have risen. We have not been in continuous negotiations with you and we want to get in a better negotiation with you to ensure that we have some shared responsibility for the rapidly rising inflation and rapidly rising changes in the contours of the labor market. So I think this is, so to answer your question, I think this is completely predictable given the imbalance we've had between demand and supply for workers. And there are going to be some renegotiations either in continuous space, like we have been seeing, or when contracts become up for negotiation and you have to renegotiate the terms of employment. What's the difference between renegotiating the terms of your employment and a wage price spiral? Oh, that's a huge difference. So let me, I love that kind of question. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. So I'm straight. <laughs> the re, labor renegotiations are, I'm looking at, you know, what I've had to put up, what I've had to deal with as an employee. A lot of it is I've got this wage and inflation's going up this, so my real wage is falling. That's something that was commonly happening in 22 in the United States. Real wages were falling for many, many groups of workers, many tiers of wages. And that's something people, workers recognize, right? They recognize when their real wages are falling. They're losing purchasing power. They're falling behind, even though they're earning. So that is what a labor negotiation is. It also could be like in healthcare and things, hours work, terms of trade, you know, schedules, et cetera. The a wage price spiral is that people get wage growth and then producers, I mean, you know, firms selling pass that along to consumers that causes inflation to go up. And then they see that inflation and they ask for wage growth. And you see this high correlation, a fact that's worth looking at. It's a very cool plot because it tells you why we're not in a wage price spiral right now is pre- prior to 85, the correlation between wage growth and price growth was like 0.85. That broke down after the Volcker disinflation, and it really is now like 0.25, 0.3, et cetera. So you don't have that one-for-one pass-through of wages to prices, prices to wages. It just doesn't work that way. And even now, you see wage growth moderating. And I also look at short-run inflation expectations. Short-run inflation expectations are coming down. As they come down, research out of the San Francisco Fed has shown, and others have confirmed this, that short-run inflation expectations are what people are using when they go in to negotiate wages. And so as those come down, you get release of wage pressure. So we are, the worries about wage price spiral, you know, people were worried about it in 22. And I really, we took that very seriously. We asked how that was going. At this point, those have really abated. And now we're really at a point about getting the wage growth rate to be balanced in the economy, bringing the labor market into balance, add- the kind of the, you know, you need about 100,000 of jobs per month to keep pace with the labor force growth. At the last call, we were at 150. So, tomorrow's labor market report will tell us whether we've made more progress on that space or just sort of uh, in that same place we've been in. But that's, that's how it's different. They're completely different. One keeps me up at night. One is just a natural part of an economy. So I love that when we were speaking ahead of this, uh, we were talking about anecdotal data. And I said, you know, I love that you study 
the sociology of markets and anecdotes are really important. And she said, I don't view them as anecdotes. They're qualitative data. I think and I said it that way. You yeah. did. And you corrected me. You said, absolutely not. I wouldn't call it anecdotes. It is qualitative data. What is the qualitative data or the anecdotes that you, the yeah, conversations you're having? Yeah, here's why I don't call them anecdotes, because anecdotes are like I talked to Bob in the grocery store. And then I now I know everything. That and that's what you know. People trade anecdotes all the time because they heard one person, two people, four people at a party say it. At the Fed, the regional Fed presidents in particular, I think it's one of the big benefits of having a regional Fed. When the when the folks who set this up set it up, I think they they thought this would happen, and it does happen. Is the regional Fed presidents and the entire regional Fed teams? We're in our districts collecting qualitative information by talking to many people like you, having roundtables, et cetera, but then we write it up. And so the difference in an anecdote and qualitative information is we we quantify the qualitative information. If one person says it, it does not mean it's the thing we should take on as fact. But if 50 people say the same thing, well, that's an early warning sign or a some flavor that helps us, you know, push, flush out what the um what the what the aggregate data are telling us, and what the qualitative data are telling me are really I'll, there's many things, but I'll tell you a few. So at the beginning of this year, I'd say most of my conversations when I asked them what's your biggest concern, they said recession. Then it switched to stagflation. They thought we were going to have high inflation forever, just low growth like we did before the pandemic. And now it's like now I say what's your biggest worry, and this is really remarkable. They said, well, I'm really worried about generative AI and how it changes my business in 10 years. I'm really worried we're not educating our population enough to keep pace with the jobs we are creating. So why am I focusing on those? Because those are longer term concerns, which means the anxiety they have about their short term business has gone down and it's being replaced with the things that, sh- that really should keep business leaders up at night, right? What is, how is this going to transform my business? Do I have the workforce I need not today, but five years from now, 10 years from now? What do I need to do in my communities to ensure that we're durable? So that has been a sea change. And then when you meet, when you drill down, like with commercial real estate leaders, of course, there were, they're thinking hard about, Okay, I've got this property. What's the future? And the, but their attitude—it was really interesting uh, across the board. It doesn't matter what position they're holding. Is they say they're going to be losses, but they're going to be opportunities. And what I'm trying to do in my business when I went around to each of them is say I'm trying to minimize the losses and maximize my ability to see and take the opportunities. And I, so I see that as a positive change in. The environment we're in. And it's why, you know, I said in this, in the speech that the recession fears are being replaced by soft landing. Soft landing is just in their description, something that happens that doesn't break the economy and bring all their attention to how do I manage through a, a significant downturn. And I am not seeing that in their, when I take their, the temperature on that, I'm seeing instead they're talking about these longer term issues that they're grappling with. Does that mean that they're hoarding labor? reluctant to cut jobs because they do have this expectation that even if there is some sort of slowdown, there is going to be a brighter future ahead with not as many qualified uh, employees available to do the jobs that need to get done. So I I have the benefit of having done this uh, work for a while. I was at the Fed long before I became the president and I've been a labor economist my whole career. So I would like to broaden that, that, that part out just to add. So it is very common when employers go through big shocks, that that carries over into their behavior. So let's go to um, the fact that in the financial crisis, employers had to cut nominal wages. They hate cutting nominal wages they, they, because it demoralizes employees, et cetera. So that had a long tail. They had to fire a lot of workers, right? They had to let go. And they, you know, for a lot of employers, if you're not the very largest employers in our country, you're you're letting go of people you know each and every member of your team, and you had to let those workers go. And then you had to cut nominal wages. It's extremely painful. So then they hired extraordinarily slowly and kept working people overtime and other things just so they didn't have to be in a situation where they would have to let go of workers should another shock come. So now what I'm seeing is the opposite of this. In the pandemic, people lost workers because they were afraid to come to work or they just they decided to take early retirement or they moved away. And so now employers are like, oh gosh, I better keep people. 
So I think we have to put certain amount of this behavior we're seeing to that. But the other part is, and this is another benefit of doing this for a while, I think, is another part is that it, the way it works in most cycles is that the very first thing that happens is hiring slows. The second thing that happens is layoffs occur. You don't have a lot of firms laying people off before they slowed their hiring. So when I'm looking at metrics for what I think is happening to the labor market, I'm looking at hiring statistics, job filling rates. You might have postings out there, but you're not filling. And what I'm seeing is a general slowdown, but not a cliff. But you know, obviously, if there was a significant downturn, then then businesses have to resize. But we're not seeing that yet. Even the layoffs we've seen have come in the tech sector where they got a little bit ahead of themselves on growth and then had to rebalance their uh, workforce to meet the actual growth they were going to have. So I, I don't see anything out there that is ringing an alarm bell about the workforce. And people say labor hoarding. I kind of think of it as we're just always fighting the last war. And you fight the last war of we had to lay off a lot of people. You don't want anybody new. You fight the last war of, oh my gosh, I lost a lot of people. You hang on tight. We're also in a very tight labor market from the employer's perspective. You know, it's 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 loosening, but from an employer's perspective, they still have to spend a lot of their time finding workers to replace workers you leave, or if they want to open a new slot, that's expensive. So they're, they definitely want to hang on to as many people as possible. I have to open it up to questions in a second, but I do want to just ask you this before I do that. What do you think right now is the biggest misconception about the Fed and how they're operating policy? Well, one mis- I don't know if it's the biggest misconception. I, I would love to hear what you all think the biggest conception is so that I could you know, tell you whether it's an actual <laughs> misconception or, uh, or true. But, the, um, but I think one thing that I've seen people say is, and, and it's just interesting, so we always have vigorous debates. That's, I mean, that's what you should expect from us, that we vigorously debate and discuss. People are bringing, I mean, we all come from different backgrounds. We use different lenses. We have different information. We talk to different people. We have different research teams. So, of course, we're all bringing it in, but we're all working towards the same goal, which is what's the best policy we can make today that will serve the goals of achieving price stability and full employment? That's what we're doing. When we were in the pandemic, If you look at the dot plots and things, it looked like there was a ton of agreement. Well, how? of course there's a ton of agreement. The only thing we can do is lend support to the economy. Then when inflation is 7%, there's a ton of agreement about what we should do with rates. Not surprisingly, inflation is way off our goal. We have to raise rates. Now we're going to start to see a little more dispersion in the dots, but that is not because we suddenly started debating and suddenly started disagreeing with one another. It's because the situations around us changed and we've always debated and discussed and things like that. But now the policy projections change because people have a different projection about what, how they see the economy unfolding. And yet we all come together eight times a year and make a policy decision. And I see that as the real strength of the FOMC. It's one of the reasons I've worked at the Fed as long as I have is because when you close that door to the meeting, there's no politics, there's no ego, there's just, hey, let's try to figure out what we're going to do that's best for the American people. And how do we do this well? And how do we stay vigilant and agile? Mary Daly, thank you so much. I'm now going to open it up to questions. I believe there'll be someone going around with a microphone. Thank you so much. Um, Constance Hunter, Macro Policy Perspectives. So Mary, you talked about SuperCore. Um, and in August, a PCE SuperCore was up about 0.14%. We continue at this pace. By the time we get to March, it's going to go from about 3.7% three-month annualized to let's call it 2.2, 2.3. If we get there and we're at 2.3% annualized on super core, what would stop the Fed from raising rates or lowering rates rather at that point? So, so one thing that, you know, we'll have, if we keep on the pace of that coming down and that's a, so we, you know, we waited and waited and waited for goods to come down. And now they finally have. We waited and waited and waited for shelter prices to come down, and now they have. And if we have waited and waited and waited for core super core to come down, and now it is, well, then that would, I am almost positive, be reflected in the December and the March SEP. The September SEP, which is what we're all pricing on, is one where super core is still elevated, 
yes, directionally okay, but still elevated. So then it's about, do you extrapolate from the direction of change or do you think about the level? So I'm thinking about the level and the direction of change, keeping an open mind. And so I, I guess what I'm saying is that when you, when you hear what we're doing, what we say we think we'll need to do today, that's conditional on the information we see today. And I personally think we need to risk manage on this situation. So risk management calls for not getting um, too excited to call victory and say, oh, I saw the PC super core go down in August. So we're on, we're on train. I think that would be a mistake because we aren't there yet. So I want to see it in the data. I want to see that direction of change be repeated before I would say, okay, we can relax some of the restriction on policy that we've got projected out. When that should, if that should happen, then of course we would rebalance the policy in order to not over tighten on the economy. I mean, the operating principle that I use, and you'll, if you read the commentary of my colleagues, you will, I'm, I'm sure you will see it embedded in their commentary is you have to calibrate policy in real time. You have to, if, if, if inflation comes down, and not only is the policy rate then more restrictive, but we don't need to have it as tight as it is, then we would make those adjustments. But pr- predicting we're going to have that, that glorious path doesn't really serve anyone. Because another th- thing we have to hang on to is the credibility that we will get the job done. And there's right now a lot of concern percolating out there. Some are excited about it. Some are concerned that we'll stop short and leave it at, you know, around 3%. That is not a, a, a positive outcome for the economy. You know, that you can just do a simple calculation of what 3% versus 2% inflation looks like for the average consumer. Now, eventually all things adjust, but that's eventually. The transition costs of moving, you know, from 2 to 3% is high. And so are we even stuck at 3%? They're high. So our commitment is to 2 and that's why risk management. I um, Obviously, we would adjust policy if the conditions warranted it. But if I say anything more specific than that, it gets written down. And then that doesn't serve us. So that is that is really my commitment. We are going to keep going until we are confident that we are on the path to 2%. Adjusting for all the other things in the environment, not, not blindly on a fixed path, but actually taking in all the information uh, with agility. And vigilance. And vigilance. Vigilance <laughs> and agility. We got a question up front, I think, too. That you might have missed, but okay, I'm 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 betting on you here. Thanks, uh, Ian Shepherdson, Pantheon Macroeconomics. Um, you talked a lot about policy being tight, uh, restrictive. You've raised rates a long way. Inflation expectations have come down, uh, and you're shrinking the balance sheet. Well, a trillion dollars since the peak now, and, and continuing to do that. So I just wonder whether uh, you agree that there might be a case for taking perhaps a slightly longer pause between. Um, the, the September set and and keeping markets hanging on at every meeting, thinking that you might be raising rates again. You know the quality of the data that we get. The macro data isn't great. Um, you know, the payroll numbers plus or minus one hundred forty thousand every month in terms of revision. So, is there not a case for saying we can wait a, a bit longer than just till the next meeting to form a more considered opinion, rather than having markets thinking, okay, they didn't do anything this time, but they might go next time. I see. So you know, I would hope. And, and that what markets would be able to do is look at the reaction function uh, elements, right? So the obviously you're, I'm here today and I'm saying, speaking for myself, that you know when bond yields rise, well, obviously that's a factor in my thinking about how much we need to do, additional we need to do. If the data are coming in slowing as we anticipate or would like to see, like. Um, Constant just mentioned, you know, we have the PCE coming down. Well, then markets would take that in and say that the need to raise is not as prevalent as it was, um, as it was when those things weren't doing what they're doing. And I would say that the market probabilities, while we haven't given markets perhaps the certainty that they want, the market probabilities for both November and December right now don't look out of line with what the uncertainty in the data are. You know, last I checked, the market probability on November was low and there was a little bit more positive. There was a little more probability on a December move, but not extraordinarily high. And to me, that's consistent with what we see, right? Bond yields have risen. 
And, and when bond yield, yields rose, you saw the probability on the November meeting go down. To me, that says the markets are understanding how we think about the things and they do have the reaction function in mind. And, you know, then hopefully the communication we do inter meeting, I know the chair is, is, it comes out and speaks in, in between press conferences and things and all of us do as well. Hopefully we're adding some additional, um, clarity to this idea. But the reason I don't want to get too far ahead is because we could find ourselves with data that are really accelerating again. And then I don't want to be in a position where we've said definitively, we're not going to do X and then X is needed. So I, I, that's why this tolerance of uncertainty is so important. And the, the forward guidance doesn't go away, but it gets less precise on a, on a meeting by meeting basis, right? It was a really for many years now, because we had the pain pandemic and we had the tightening for uh, to get policy into restrictive, it's been pretty clear what we're doing meeting to meeting. Those probabilities were really close each time. Now we're in a much more uncertain world about what is going to be needed. And so when you don't know exactly what will be needed, it's not actually a terrific idea to telegraph one thing over the other. It's a, it's better to do, I think, what we're doing, which is saying we're going to have to think about it. And here are the factors we're looking at. But I, but to your broader point, if I thought the probabilities were terribly out of alignment with the uncertainties we face, I might, I might be more concerned, but they're not. Hi, President Daly. You've talked about long and variable lags and forward guidance. And it's been mentioned that uh, forward guidance is a means to lessen the time of the long lag. Do you see any evidence that, it, that that's working? And how long will this forward guidance be needed to? like the idea that we have forward guidance. So the most important tool is our funds rate. The second most important tool, to my mind, is forward guidance. And then the third tool we have is the balance sheet. And I put them in those rankings because we have a lot of experience with the funds rate. We have the next most experience with forward guidance. And then the third most experience with what I think of as the tanker ship of the balance sheet. Right. We can adjust the other two with like speedboat and the other, the third one, the balance sheet's like a, a tanker ship. It takes a long time to turn. So those are how I stack rank the tools. I, there are many uses of forward guidance, but one of the most important ones is that we can telegraph what we're doing so that people can plan, but it also accelerates how quickly markets adjust. What I'm not as clear on and and, and I've never been as clear on, I've said this publicly before, is forward guidance helps us go from what we want to do over the course of a year to financial markets. And if you look back to when we even uh, pivoted and said we would taper asset purchases faster in November of 21, then it already started to raise the mortgage interest rate. By March, you know, we had the, the mortgage interest rate was already up and refit fi had completely stopped. So that was forward guidance that got immediately into financial markets. That is very, very quick. But that's only half of the lag. So that part of the lag was shortened by a lot. The second part of the lag, though, is from financial markets to, con to real conditions. And that lag, our forward guidance helps a little bit maybe, but not that much because it's really, let's take commercial real estate. It all has to do with the schedule of refinancing. It all has to do with when you were thinking about doing projects. So if you were, if you're going to put a new project together, then that whatever rates there, matters for you. But if you're just refining or figuring out how you're going to roll over debt, et cetera, this, is, this won't affect you until those moments occur. And so that's why I think there's still time for that real side to go. And then, of course, this time around, the long and variable lags have been, it's hard to distinguish. I will call these observationally equivalent theories right now, because we don't have evidence yet that would say one versus the other. So right now, it's very hard to know whether the momentum in the economy has just been stronger than we thought. I mean, consumers have been more resilient than I think any of us imagined they would be. The second possibility is that the transmission mechanism is weaker or slower than we predicted. And the third one is that our star is higher, right? The real neutral is higher. And there's conversations about, let's maybe think about raising the real neutral, but ultimately, you've got these other two things you have to manage. When I'm taking some 
comfort in is I think the lags are having an effect, right? We're starting to see housing. We're starting to see demand slow. We're starting to see as Constant just met, mentioned the PCE super core came down. These are all ev- pieces of evidence that policy is working. And that is a good thing. If it hadn't worked yet, I would be more concerned. But it, but I think, I think our forward guidance, I'll say one last thing and then we, I know I have to leave, but the forward guidance that we did with the SEP, I think part of that is being translated into bond yields. Not all of it, but part of the bond yield rise has to do with that that forward guided. So that's how it works. Well, many thanks to you both. That was just a terrific conversation. Thank you. I'm pleased to report that we have many great speakers. I'm not going to outline all of them that are coming up, but let me just quickly do October. Um, on October 12th, we have Mustafa Suleiman, the author and CEO of Inflection AI and co-founder of Google DeepMind for a breakfast. And she'll be in a, he'll be in a conversation actually with Marie Jose Kravis, our former chair. On October 17th, we'll host Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel for a luncheon. And of course, on October 19th, we have Jay Powell joining us, the chair of the Federal Reserve, also for a luncheon. And uh, on October 25th, we have a webinar with the president and CEO of Northwell Health, Michael Dowling. Uh, The only other thing I want to mention quickly is we have confirmed Bill Gates, for those of you that have not heard, on December 7th, uh, we'll have a dinner honoring him uh, as he will receive the Peter G. Peterson Leadership Excellence Award, which is the only award given by the club, and we do give it annually. And uh, just a quick note that we have launched our first ever podcast uh, titled The Forum, and that's hosted by club trustee Becky Quick. So you can tune in to all the streaming platforms and find that. We encourage you to do that. And then finally, as we always like to do, we want to thank those members of our uh, Centennial Society joining us today for their contributions, which continue to provide the financial backbone of support for the club and our programming. So again, thank you to everyone joining us virtually. We'll see you later. For everyone in the room, please enjoy your lunch. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you again.